Free radical bromination is regioselective. This means that the bromine will add itself to a particular region or area along the carbon chain. Let's take a look at how this works with this first example. These reagents, Br2 with light, will add one bromine atom somewhere along this carbon chain. The mechanism of this reaction, which I'm not gonna draw in detail, is that the alkane, propane in this case, is initially converted to a carbon radical and then the carbon radical adds itself to a bromine radical and that will end up giving us our brominated alkane. This reaction proceeds via the most stable carbon radical. So that means that when this propane molecule is being converted to a carbon radical, it is going to selectively choose to form the most stable carbon radical. So our first job in predicting the products of this reaction is to determine what the most stable carbon radical is from the propane molecule. The propane molecule has two possible carbon radicals. We could put the radical, the unpaired electron, on carbon number one, or we could put the unpaired electron on carbon number two. You might be thinking, couldn't we put the unpaired electron on carbon number three as well? Recognize that that is exactly the same as on carbon number one, so there's really only two possible radicals here. So there's two possible carbon radicals that can be formed from propane. The first one that I drew is a primary carbon radical, and the second one that I drew is a secondary carbon radical. And you know that the secondary radicals are more stable than the primary radicals, which means that the secondary radical is the radical that will be used in this particular mechanism. So this primary radical is just not going to be formed and the reaction will proceed via the secondary radical. This means that this secondary, let me erase my smiley face here, the secondary radical is the one that will be reacting with the bromine radical and that ultimately then the product of this reaction will be 2-bromopropane. Again, we're putting the bromine on the carbon atom that was the most stable radical. Now with chlorination, there is no regioselectivity. Chlorination, the chlorine radical, it just adds itself to every single carbon in the molecule. Because the, carb the chlorine radical is so unstable, the reaction itself doesn't have the patience to selectively form a primary versus, or excuse me, a secondary versus a primary radical. Every single possible product is formed. So that means when we're chlorinating, we're going to put, in this case, the chlorine onto carbon number one. We're also gonna put the chlorine onto carbon number two. And you might be thinking, let's also put it on carbon number three. But again, recognizing that because of the symmetry of this molecule, carbon number one is the same as carbon number three. So there's two possible products um, that are formed during the chlorination of propane. Even though there are two possible products that are formed, we do still see the major product being the one that comes from the most stable carbon radical. Let's practice this a little bit more. So here is another set of bromination and chlorination of the exact same alkane. With bromination, because this is selective, we want to find the most substituted carbon in this molecule. That's going to be the location of the bromine. This is a primary carbon. This is also a primary carbon. This one is tertiary, so that's probably going to be where we go. That's secondary. That's primary. The tertiary carbon is going to be the one that has the most stable radical, so that's going to be the location of the bromine that is added in this particular reaction. And again, this is not a major minor product situation. There's just one product, only one product. Um, now for chlorination, because with chlorination, everything, the chlorine goes everywhere. We don't have any selectivity. We're going to begin by just putting the chlorine onto every single carbon atom in this molecule. We're going to recognize that these two positions in the molecule are identical. So we've got one, two, three, four possible chlorines, or four possible carbons where the chlorine could go. We've got one right here. We've got one right here and one here, and then down at the end of the chain. 
Now, with this, when we add chlorines to the carbon atoms in this molecule, you know, just like we have done before in the past with SN1 and SN2 type reactions, we always have to be thinking about whether or not we are creating chiral carbons and if stereochemistry has been introduced into the reaction. So when we're looking through these, like for example, when we look at this molecule, we added the chlorine to this particular carbon. This carbon is not chiral because it has two methyl groups on it. So putting the chlorine onto this carbon right here, there's just one product. When we put the chlorine on this carbon right here, we turned this carbon into a chiral carbon. There's also a hydrogen on there as well, so this carbon now has four different things attached to it, which means that we have some stereoisomers that we have made. I'm going to squeeze in the enantiomer down here. Um, we did get a hint in this problem that says that there's four constitutional isomers. That's these four right here, and then two pairs of stereoisomers. Uh, this molecule over here, so we put the chlorine onto this carbon, which has two hydrogens on it, so no stereoisomers for that particular carbon. So that means that this first molecule that we drew, this must also have a stereoisomer. And at first it might not look like it. We put the chlorine onto this carbon here, which has two hydrogens, and this carbon is not chiral. So where's the chirality? Adding the chlorine onto this carbon atom made it so that these two groups were no longer identical, which meant that this carbon, which used to be a chiral because it had two methyl groups on it, this carbon is now chiral because it has four different things on it. So you have to be kind of sneaky with these. You know, in terms of drawing the stereochemistry, just pick any bond that you want and make it a wedge and then draw your enantiomer like that. So there's the six products for this reaction. Uh, and then our major product is going to be coming from the chlorine being added to the most stable radical, which is um, the, the tertiary radical. Here is one last set of examples. Um, same molecule, either brominating or chlorin chlorinating it. When we're brominating it, we're making just one product. So we wanna go through this molecule. When I'm brominating, the first thing I wanna do is ask myself, are there any benzylic carbons? Are there any allylic carbons? Uh, there aren't in this case, then is there a tertiary carbon? Boom, there's our tertiary carbon. So when I'm brominating, I'm just kind of going down the list of stability, starting with the most stable type of radical and just working my way down. That's our one bromination product. For chlorination, it says we have 13 possible products. So this is going to be a lot. So we're going to begin by putting the chlorine in all of the possible places on the ethyl chain coming off the molecule. So there's two. Adding the chlorine to this particular carbon made it a stereocenter. So I'm going to draw the enantiomer for that. And now I'm gonna start putting the chlorine around the ring. So first, putting it right here. And this one is going to be the major product. For chlorination, the major product is always the one that is structurally equivalent to the, the single product for bromination. So we've got four products drawn. Now let's continue going around the ring. I'm gonna go clockwise. So our next spot is right here. And now we've got some interesting stereochemistry options here. So in terms of these substituents, these substituents could be cis to each other. They could be trans to each other. Like that. Um, they could be, let's just keep going around the ring and let's see how much more, because I think we're gonna have more stereochemistry options for the, the, this relative position of these two substituents but let's just kind of keep going around the ring. So our next option would be to put the chlorine right here. And again, let's draw these two cis to each other. Let's kind of stick with the same pattern and draw them trans to each other. And then we've got one more spot on the ring. And then we'll count and see how we're doing. So there's um, the last place on the ring. Let's make these substituents cis to each other and let's make them 
trans to each other. And then let's see how far we are. So we know we've got 13 possible products and so far we have come up with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So that means we have three more for each of these. Um, and like I said, I was thinking we would have one more possible configuration. That's gonna be reversing the wedge and the dash for all of the trans substituents. So we are going to, I'm actually gonna draw them. I'm gonna kind of box this off and we'll draw the last three products up here. So I'm taking molecule number six and we're just gonna swap it's gonna still be trans, but we're going to swap which substituent is the wedge and which substituent is the dash. That's gonna be molecule number 11. Now we're going to take our next trans, molecule number eight, and we're gonna swap the wedge and the dash there as well. If you're a little bit confused about um, why, how does this make a difference, what you can do is assign R and S stereochemistry to the chiral carbons in these molecules, which probably aren't really excited to do. Um, neither am I. But if you assign stereochemistry to them, you'll see that they are actually different from each other. So last molecule that I drew, number 13, is the um, enantiomer of molecule number 10. And there's all 13 of our products with our major product right there.